Yeah, I think a lot of it has been easier than what I thought it was going to be. As y'all know, I'm an emotional person. So, you know, every time we win, I'm balling and all those things. And um, I know how hard it is to, to get opportunity like I have and to win races is extremely hard these days. And, um, you know, I'm still the guy that grew up in Mooresville and had three cup wins before Kevin Harvick picked me to do this. And now I have 40. Um, yeah, there's not many people that will ever walk through this garage. It has 40 cup wins as a crew chief. And if it wasn't for him, it would have never happened, right? Um, so, you know, that part is extremely uh, emotional and, and uh, grateful. Um, and then, you know, I thought the parts that would hit me the most was during the national anthems every week, standing beside the car and... I still remember when I was car chiefing and, you know, it was Rusty's last year and uh, the one that hit me the most, I, I was, I, I bawled, cried uh, when Rusty uh, last race at the Bristol night race. And I don't know if y'all remember, but they had all those cards that everybody held up in the stands and it said Rusty all the way around turns one or two. Um, so, you know, I had that in my head that it would be the the national anthems that hit me the most, but it really hasn't. It's been the videos that, that Stuart Haas has done such a good job at and um, the things like that. I mean, it's, and it's not just me, it's it's everybody on the team and it's wives and children and, and people that have, um, you know, just put so much into it. Um, you know, the, we're fortunate that we don't work the hours that we used to work in 2014, but man, you just think back on that year. I mean, sadly enough, I ended up with two or three people with divorces by the end of the year, and it was because of our race team, and it was because of what we were doing and what we, and all that, and that's, that's sad to think about, but, you know, we worked ourselves to death to just try to make sure that we could, you know, win a championship for him in that first year, and, um, so you know it, it's been a it's been a long 10 years and it's been a short 10 years at the same time it feels like it has just flown by like it feels like it was just yesterday um but you know we don't take for granted all those wins and you know those brickyard 400s man were just that meant everything to me so um we've had a lot of special ones but um it's been a, a ton of fun and you don't want to see it end but he is, he's ready, uh, he's past ready, and um, you know, we're looking forward to these last few. Jordan Bianchi, The Athletic, uh, you talked about a lot on track memories. Um, off the track, what's some of the memories you take away from your time with Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I think the things that, um, you know, away from the racetrack is just what he's taught me as far as, you know, being a leader and working hard and just never accepting you know, being mediocre. Um, I think that drives Katrina absolutely crazy sometimes because nothing is ever good enough. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's how the, the, the carpet's vacuumed or if it's whatever, but that, that all comes from him, sadly. Um, but, you know, I, I remember like two years ago, it was something at home and she goes, all right, Kevin, you're just, you, you can't look at it that way. But, um, you know, we, we've just done a lot together, you know, I mean, it, it's when you talk to somebody every day for 10 years, I mean, it is, uh, it's going to be culture shock when we don't do that. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of it wasn't really about race cars, you know, it was, you know, this or that today, or, you know, I'm going to do this today and you wouldn't believe what I saw today and just normal friendship stuff. It wasn't you know, we're going to this track this weekend and you need to study this or you need to do that or like it was never like that. It was just like when one of y'all walk up to me in the garage and carry on a conversation. That's how it's been for 10 years. There was never, you know, poking each other in the chest and all that kind of stuff. We just naturally wanted the same things and um, it was, it was honestly easy. It was the easiest relationship that you could possibly have. And I think going to get ice cream at Dover in 2013, um, I was worried it was going to be the worst relationship and get yelled at a lot. So it was the easiest uh, thing that, that I, you know, 
could have chose. So it was it was good. Looking at his legacy, stepping away from it, how would you assess it? Well, I think, you know, looking at his legacy is really more than just driving the race car. It was, you know, the day-to-day um, of the sport, wanting the sport to be better, wanting the safety to be better, wanting these kids to act better, wanting them to do things the right way. Uh, growing a, a bush team and a truck team, that was just lights out every time they showed up at the racetrack. Uh, expecting the most out of uh, out of everybody, and honestly, expecting the most out of you know even y'all. You know, like if you think about it, like he expected the most out of everybody in this media center, and everybody in that cup hauler, and everybody in that bush hauler, and everybody at the R and D center. Like he just expected everybody to give their absolute best all the time, and to try to make everything better. And um, he never wavered from that one bit. Uh, as y'all have seen over the years, he's never, never given up on that, and and has stayed, you know, strong to his to his heart of what he thought was right. Claire B. Lang, Sirius XM NASCAR Radio. I, I interviewed Timmy Fidua and Roddy Childers and Beave uh, for my show the other night, and one thing that they all mentioned was in the beginning. I mean, here you form this race team that ends up winning a championship the first year. They all asked you if Harvick was as much of a hothead as they thought that he was going to be, and then they all love him and come around. How did you do that, and how was that to have the members of the team asking you, is this guy a hothead? Is that what we're going to have to work with now? Yeah, I remember those early days of, you know, trying to just hire people to start a race team, and um, we were just talking about it in the hauler. I had, I had every day planned, and it was seven days a week. I would meet somebody for breakfast at 7 a.m., and I would talk to them until 9.30. And then from 9.30 to 10.30, I had a break, and then I would meet somebody else at 11 for lunch, and I would talk to them until 2.30, and then I would meet somebody else at 3 and talk to them until 5. And then after 5, I would meet somebody for dinner at 7. And it was all day, every day, of trying to just talk to people and get them to come join our team. And it was the same conversation. Like, if you met four people a day and did four interviews a day, it was the same kind of conversation of, you know, what do you think he's going to be like and what is he going to act like and is he going to scream and yell at us every time we do something wrong? And um, the true racers that wanted to win a race, you know, win races and wanted to win a championship, they didn't really ask that question a whole lot. I mean, most of them did. Um, But even the guys that I ended up with, they – they still ask the question and they to this day they love him to death and you know it's it really comes down to maybe a misrepresentation of what he was in the past and everything that was going on and you know when you're 20 years old versus 40 years old there's a big difference Uh, you know i think of the stuff that i did at that age and it was completely stupid and you think about it now and it's like, man, there was so many ways of going about that. And, and um, you know, right off the get-go, he's been fantastic to all of us and uh, great to work with, has treated all of us like gold and, and um, just a, a lot of fun. And the guys from your 2014 team told me, you mentioned it, how hard you all worked. And they were talking about the amount of hours that you guys worked, as you mentioned, to win that championship. Is it ever hard for you that in today's era, if you want to get better, it doesn't always reflect hours and hours? Like you put more work in and you can be better. That It helps, but it isn't the salute. You can't do that these days, right? Yeah, I mean, the, everything was so much different back then. Um, you know, you could you could work, you could outwork people then. Um, you know, let's say we had 16 cars that we had to build for that season, and we're sitting there with three. Um, you know, January 1st, and every one of them you want it to be detailed more than everybody in the garage and that comes down to how much paint you put on the chassis and every nut and every bolt and the body and the bondo work and all this and that like our daytona 500 car going into 2014 we took it out and buffed it five times and put clear on it again and buff it again and put clear on it again like it looked like a show car when we loaded it up i mean that stuff you don't have to do is it really going to make it go any faster no but 
when we unloaded for our first race, we wanted everything that we had to be the be the best. And um, you know, I think back on that stuff now, and like I think we just all worked off of adrenaline. Like I don't think we even realized what we were doing. Like, and y'all know what family means to me. And I think back on that whole time, and like the only day we took off was Christmas Day, the whole winter. We worked seven days a week, and on New Year's Day, Cheddar said, are we working tomorrow? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, you do know it's New Year's Day. And I was like, well, that's not really a holiday. That's what I said. And now I think back on that, I'm like, God, I was a jack hole. Like, I mean, just thinking on the whole thing, and, it, you know, we could, have, we could have done it different. But I think all of us were just so mindset on how we were going to do it and I saw in that one video, Beeb said that he had not seen somebody act that way since Ray. But I worked for Ray. I got, that's, that's where I got that from. And, you know, uh, to this day, I respect that. And, um, you know, the, the good ones in the garage all came from Ray or they came from Chad or all that, you know. So it's really a mindset, but um, it's really hard to keep that going. Like, you could you couldn't work that hard for 10 years straight there's no possible way it's just, just not going to happen nobody would have any families left number one but your physical status would not be very good either so um yeah i mean it was uh it was good and um you know i wish that we could replay some of that and go back in time but it, it's all been good for 10 years straight we go to lee and then dustin Lee Spencer, catchfence.com. Clearly, none of us are going to question your work ethic, but the competitor that you are, is this the most frustrating year of your career? I don't think so. And I think, you know, I, we all want to run good, but I think this year we've kind of looked at things differently than, than maybe what we would have in the past. In 2015, if we were running like this, it would be having everybody by the throat every week and all that and we've tried to enjoy ourselves as much as possible and keep smiles on our faces and all those things and I think it really doesn't show what we've done as a team this year um, I mean we were in the top four in points what half the year this year and everybody was talking about how bad we were like 90 percent of the garage would absolutely love to do that and We've had four races that we had the best car and we didn't win and didn't work out at the end. I mean, if you would have won those four races, it'd be a totally different conversation. And, um, you know, even today, like everybody thinks our car's junk. And if you pull up lap 26 of everybody's runs, we're faster than everybody. So, um, you know, he says the car drives good for tomorrow and all that. And, and it was the same thing last week. We got done in practice and we went to our post-practice meeting. He goes, my car's good. And like, that's what a lot of people don't see, you know, sitting at home or in the media center and all, you don't get to see him walk in the trailer and tell everybody else that he's working with that his car's really good. And, you know, whether we, whether we march to the front and win the race tomorrow or not, is, it is what it is, right? We all worked as hard as we could coming down here. We put the springs and shocks and all that to what we thought would be best. And sometimes it's good enough and sometimes it's not. And you know, we all want to win. Um, you know, y'all know me good enough. If I could, if I could pull the right rear tail back and 700 thou and put an inch of bondo on it and do all the things that you used to be able to do, I can beat them all day, every day. But uh, it's a different world right now, and you have to hit it perfect, and you know your engines have to be the best, and you know, um, all those things. So, um, you know, we. We, we still look forward to going to the racetrack every week. We don't Debbie Downer every week. We don't have meetings talking about how bad we suck. We, we still talk about the same things we have for 10 years and how we're going to be the best forward and, and try to go out there and compete the best we can. You mentioned Rusty. You know, clearly Kevin had the, the connection to, to Earnhardt. You know, we're seeing a changing of the guard. Can you just kind of as long as you've been here, and you mentioned Ray too, I mean, we're looking, with Kevin's departure, we're looking at the end of an era. What do you anticipate we'll see next? I know for me, five years ago was scary because, you know, I grew up with the uh, Dell Juniors and Jimmy Johnsons and um, 
Kevin Harvick's and, and all that. And I could see it all coming, you know, it's like, what are we going to do when these guys are gone? And we've been extremely fortunate to have somebody like William Byron come in and Ross Chastain and all these guys that, um, number one, the fans like, that's, that's what you have to have as a sport is somebody that, that you really, you know, you, the fans really want to root for and really want to be a part of. And, and, um, you know, some of these guys are starting to fill those roles and, you know, whether we can, you know, we need more of those. We need more of those superstars coming up and, you know, to my hope, I, I hope Josh Berry can end up being one. Right. But, um, that's what we have to have is just to continue to, um, attract, you know, attract the people that are sitting in those stands that, that want to come spend their money to watch us race and to buy souvenirs and do all the things that we've all done for years and years and years. So, um, you know, the, the good thing that I've seen is, is Jeff Gordon hasn't went anywhere and he's still on that pit box most weeks. Uh, to see Michael Jordan here every week has been like, it gives me chill bumps. Like, how, how, how can he not have something better to do at this point in his life, right? So, um, you know, to have all these guys that are getting out of it, and Jimmy Johnson buying in to the, to the legacy deal, and um, all these guys are still around. And I think as long as we can keep them around, we're in good shape. So, um, you know, the scary part five years ago is like, what are they going to do? Are they just going to quit and, you know, is Jimmy just going to move to Vail and never come back and ski every day and we're never going to see him again? And that hasn't happened one bit and he hasn't changed the lick either. So as long as we can keep all these people, you know, interested in our sport and pushing it in the right direction, and uh, I think all of us are in good shape. We'll go to Dustin and then Bob right in front of you, Dustin. Dustin Long, NBC Sports. Um, Rodney, of the different possessions that you have from your career, especially with, with Kevin, what are the things that, that have the most meaning, whether they represent a championship or maybe they represent just a special moment that you know somebody on the outside might not seem as meaningful, but when you see that particular object, it brings back that memory. What are those possessions that you have? Yeah, I mean, the big one for me is just that first Brickyard 400. Um, it was it was crazy. You know, um, I don't think you could ever replace. And thank goodness we're going back to racing the Brickyard 400. But, um, man, just the years of going there and trying and working. And, um, you know, that, that race, you know, for a car chief or a front-end mechanic was always – bigger than the season right like you just showed up at that race and man you had everything you could possibly do and qualifying day the crew chief was supposed to get a bass boat at the end of the day and like i remember all that stuff like i wanted the bass boat and then they quit doing that right before we got the pole there but um i remember um fatback was behind us on pit road one year and and um he was over there kind of BSing with me and he's like, you do know they give a boat out after this, don't you? And, and uh, I said, I did not know that. And he goes, I want that damn boat. And I look back there a little bit later and he pulls some duck bills out of his pocket and puts it on the left front fender and wings it straight out. And then Bobby sat on the pole and fat back got a, got a bass boat. But um, just those days were everything. Like they were everything like you, you just died for qualifying day there and like what's your draw and when are you going out do you have a shot at it or not like there was so much drama to all of that and even coke 600 qualifying on a thursday night and you know call you know getting to go out late and all those things like i i just loved all that and maybe i'm too old but um you know just the brickyard was just amazing uh, and then turn around and win it again the next year was even more nuts. So uh, I know me and you've talked about some of that stuff and like, you know, as far as trophies, there's Coke 600 and there's Brickyard trophies, there are championship trophies, then there's a Bristol night race and I think Pocono's sitting there beside of it and um, man, all of those, like, I mean, it's hard to win, what, three Southern 500s and two Brickyards and Coke 600 and two Bristol night races. And I mean, just the, 
I mean, you just, you don't forget those things. I can sit here and rattle them off all day and I can tell you pretty much how the race went and everything. It's, uh, it's something that sticks in your mind for a long time. I'll go to Bob. Bob Pockers, Fox Sports. Uh, when Jeff asked his question, he talked about how Kevin has been very, he's been very matter of fact and non-emotional with us. I'm curious, have you seen any emotional moments out of him? Like, does this, I have, you talk about how we don't see him in the holler about the car. Is there anything that you've seen that we haven't that would tell you, man, this last year is really special or moving for him? I think it's special and moving. I, I, I think he's a little bit the same way as me. I think some of the videos that he probably watches in private are probably the things that may get him the most. Um, he's not the type of person that's going to stand in victory lane and cry like me. Um, you know, and he never has been. Um, but he realizes, you know, how special it is and, and what all this has meant to him. And, you know, I think his same thing that we talked about with Lee is like he wants to be involved. He's not going anywhere. He wants to be in the TV booth and he wants to do a better job of telling about our sport and, you know, what these guys are doing on the racetrack and how they're driving them and what they're doing wrong. And, um, you know, he's getting more and more involved with all these young drivers, trying to teach them the right things. And, uh, you know, uh, Lane Riggs isn't even signed with KHI, but he just keeps on doing everything he can do to help that dude. And, and um, the amount that Lane has grown in the last month, and it has been sitting down and having our conversations about what you say, how you act, how you drive, don't tear up race cars, all this stuff has been incredible to me. Like, and I think, you know, y'all know my history of working with Scott. So, you know, Lane used to run around my motorhome butt naked at, you know, when he was teensy tiny, but to see Kevin just pick that up and want to help him and just, and it's not just Lane. I mean, it's all these guys. Like, I mean, he'll see, you know, one of these KHI guys do something in practice and he's like on the phone immediately. Like, why'd you do that? You're not, you can't, you got to do it like this. You got to, you know, so he's just constantly trying to make people better and he doesn't have to, um, but he just wants to. And, and I think that's going to be, you know, key for all of us. I, I, you know, he's going to be around for a long time and he cares a ton about this sport and, um, and the safety part of it, like he, he's all over these kids about helmets and seats and headrests and all these things and the Hans, um, uh, straps not being short enough. And like he, he'll sit in our trailer and watch Xfinity practice and they'll, put somebody's in-car camera on and he'll he'll text david green right that second of you need to go to the such and such car his headrest isn't right he needs shorter straps on his hans like y'all don't see all the stuff he does like he I mean, he never ever stops and he doesn't have to do any of that crap he just doesn't want to see somebody get hurt and he wants it the best for these these guys that are coming up and he wants them to learn the right way and um you know, the first time Lane was going to drive the late model, they said that they were going to do the seat fitting. And man, late model racing is different, right? I mean, Deke McCaskill wins all the time, and you go look at his car, and it's the scariest thing you've ever looked down inside of. And um, when I got to the late model shop that afternoon, there was a whole group of people, seat people. There was somebody to pour the seat. The seat belt manufacturers were there. The helmet people were there. Like you're gonna you're gonna do the seat like this, you're gonna pour it like this, you're gonna wear this helmet, you're gonna have this suit, you're gonna put these seat belts on that are custom sewn, that have no adjustment in them, that can't come loose, that can't do this, like didn't matter what it cost. He was gonna put the very best thing and it wasn't it wasn't gonna make the car go any faster, right? I mean he wanted he wants that for everybody. Like he, he just thinks that way and um so anyway, he, uh, he's on it all the time. That's all I can say, really. Go back to Jeff. Rodney, you, you alluded to this um, uh, a few minutes ago when you were talking about a lot of your tools or the things you would like to do. If, you know, they've been taken away now. And, and you've referenced, too, on, on social media a few times this year about the frustration of you know, what the next gen represents for crew chiefs. 
you know, going forward in, in future years, how, how do you see that crew chief role like evolving now? How is it going to change for you even more going forward or, or for people that come after you? Like what, what, where is this all going for, for crew chiefs? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know what the right way to say it or the right thing to say is, um, you know, for me growing up as a kid, you know, there was Dale Inman, um, you know, my grandmother was a huge Richard Petty fan. So that made me a Richard Petty fan. And I just thought Dale Inman was the greatest thing ever because he had won so many races and so many championships and done so much stuff. And then, you know, that turned into Ray Evernham and, um, you know, they were, they were superstars, you know, they were, they were huge and had their own little cards and signing stuff for fans and doing all this and that. And to me, I can't stand that we've lost that, you know, uh, these NFL coaches are as much of part of the team as anybody. Right. And I feel like a lot of that has got lost in what we're doing and it really shouldn't, you know, like, um, it, it needs to be, there still needs to be that pedestal, I think, of, you know, the best drivers and the best crew chiefs. And uh, if not, what do you have to work for? Like, what is a 10 year old kid that's going to sit with their grandmother and watch TV? Like he'd never even hear somebody's name and doesn't know anything about them. Like he just knows that so-and-so drives a race car. And when he goes to school the next day, he's just thinking about so-and-so driving the race car and he's never going to get to drive. So he's not going to get into our sport. Right. So, you need to have those moments in somebody in a kid's mind that I want to be like that one day. And, you know, and if, if you're not athletic and you're not very good at baseball, it doesn't mean you can't be on a baseball team and, and win a world series. Right. Like, I mean, that's, that's what we have to continue is to make the greats. You know, right now we can't hardly hire anybody. Like it's tough to, to get people. I, I know, you know, 20 years ago, Lord, we had resumes out, out the door of, you know, trying to, to get engineers in the door and now you can't hardly find them. So it's just that interest level. You have to, you have to think about it from that standpoint. And, um, you know, from, from what I see, I think it's going to be more engineers that come through and do it the right way. Um, you know, you don't have to have an engineering degree. Um, but you have to learn to, to think like an engineer and think about the geometry side of it and everything that's going on with the car and the jack and forces and all that. And I was fortunate enough to be around the right people at Everham that, that taught me to think about it that way, or I would have never done anything either. So, um, but I don't think you're going to have, you know, an old school late model racer from Mooresville work his way up. Uh, you know, I think that format is more for the truck series probably uh, those cars or xfinity series but the cup car has got to the point that it's like a factory and the and the body hanging and they bolt the cars together and you know we just go race them and um and you know if some people ask me are you do you feel, feel like you're giving up too much anywhere and it's like man you go through tech every week and you look at the body scan the floor scan it's like i don't know how to do it anymore and i used to be able to go home and just think about things and what we're going to do to to go faster and right now it's stale like I, I don't know how to go faster um i know that's not good for for, for saying that but um, you know, some weeks we hit it and some weeks we don't, but like, there's not just that raw speed of being a half a second faster than the field. You don't really see that with anybody, but, um, it's just real close together. I think it's going to be more engineer driven. I think the people like me, you know, to, to wonder what my next step is, I really don't know anymore. Like I used to want to be a competition director one day and. I don't know if, even at that, what that is anymore. Like you see the people that do that right now. And it's like, I don't want to deal with, you know, everybody's salaries all day, every day and everybody's contracts all day, every day. I still want to work on race cars. I want to figure out how to make them go faster. I want to make the pit crew better. I want to make this building look better. The parking lot look better. And like, 
the details, like going to the restroom. The restroom should be the nicest restroom you've ever went to. And that part just eats me alive. Like I, that's the part that I want to be more involved in, in the future. And every, you know, I don't, I don't know what my next step would be, but I don't, that's uh that's a different story. But anyway, it's, uh, it's just different. It's just different. And I think the old schoolers like me that have crew chief for 20 years, it's just, you just have to think about it different. Um, we have a ton of smart people coming up and people that can do a great job and that are going to win a ton of races. And, and um, you know, there's still a, a good history there. Yeah, Cliff was, a, Cliff was a late model racer. He can still win races every week. And he still does the things the way that he thinks they need to be done and has a great team. And so... Yeah, that part's not gone, but like you said, it's definitely changing, and, and it's just going to be interesting to see how that changes over the years.